let's say I gave you like a square, and in that square we had a circle with a radius of, let's say, 2. And let's say that the square had a radius, or not a radius, but a, a width of 3. What's the area of the square? B9, right? What's the area of the circle? 4 pi, right? Does that make sense? Be pi r squared, and r is 2. So what would be the probability that we hit the square, or sorry, hit the circle knowing, or given that, we've already hit the square? What do I do with these two things to determine the probability of hitting that circle? If I subtract, if I subtract, that gives me the area in white, doesn't it? Does that make sense? So all I had to do is strictly divide them. 4 pi, because that's the likelihood. So those are the, the outcomes that are aligned with landing on the circle, right? Divided by 9, which would be the area of the whole thing. Okay? So that would be the likelihood of landing on the circle. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, here's another question that we can maybe parlay from that or parlay into that is what would be the probability of landing in the white? A couple different ways I could do it. We said if I land in the white, if I land in the white, that would be taking those two and subtracting them, right? So which one's bigger? 9 or 4 pi? Oh, yeah, that's kind of, oh, I'm an idiot. That's stupid. Think about this. <laughs> we, we, we can fix this pretty easily. Um, the radius is 2. What's the diameter of that? 4, which would be bigger than this square, wouldn't it? So let's just change. So that's my fault. Um, let's change this to 4. So that only changes that to... 16, and that's it's still the same logic. Does that make sense? Okay. So now, if I ask you how do I find the white area, you say 4 pi is the smaller one, right? 16 is now bigger. So 16 minus 4 pi, 16 minus 4 pi should give you that yellow area, yes? Is that okay with everybody? So then if I take 16 minus 4 pi and divide by everywhere that I could hit, everywhere that I could hit would be everything that is pink there, which would be 16. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. There is an easier way to do it knowing the 4 pi over 16 probability, though. If I told you the probability of landing here. Oh, let me let me do this. Let, let's say that you you know nothing about. I've got a coin that is unfair, which means that one side of it lands up more often than the other. And I say the probability of it landing heads is 0.7. You automatically know the probability of it landing tails then would be what? 0.3, right? You took one minus that, correct? So with probability, we've got what we call complement events here, okay? We were talking about the probability that we land in the circle. And that was this here, correct? Well, the probability of landing in the white would be everything else, isn't it? So it would be 1 minus 4 pi over 16, which is the same thing you did when you took 0.7 and got the 0.3, right? You took 1 minus 0.7. Well, let's think about this. If I wanted to go back to, like, 6th grade, 7th grade math, I want to subtract these. Don't I need a common denominator? And now that I have a common denominator, does that thing there turn into that there? Which we found ultimately doing a different way, right? Okay. But the idea, if I want to, and I haven't even read the problem, I don't know if I want to land in the trees or on the ground. Okay. Um, but the idea is if I can find the probability of landing in that circle, 
then I should have an understanding then of not only land, what the probability of landing in the circle is, but also at the same time, a probability of landing in just the white. Does that kind of make sense there, buddy? So if you're a parachutist, okay, you jump from an airplane and land in the rectangular field shown, what is the probability that a parachutist avoids the two trees represented by circles in the diagram. So assume that the person is unable to control the landing point. That idea, unable to control the landing point, would remove any like extraneous skill that would maybe increase my probability of landing in the orange. Does that make sense? Okay, which would skew probabilities a little bit if I've got skill here. Um, so. What's the likelihood of landing in the orange? Okay, we could do it a couple different ways. We can say that the probability of landing in orange, okay, is equal to the orange area divided by then the rectangular area. Would you guys agree with that? The rectangular area is going to be 80 times 100, correct? Does that make sense? Okay. So we know that denominator, 80 times 100, so that there. Okay, that's going to be my denominator. Now, the orange area, how do I find the orange area? Well, the orange area, isn't that going to be the rectangle minus the two circles, does that make sense? Okay, so if I look at this circle, what's the radius of this circle? Eight, okay, so that distance there is eight. So the area of that would be eight squared pi, right? So 64 pi. What's the radius of this one? Five, so that would be then minus 25 pi. So now if I go 8,000 minus, so that's going to be now what, 89 pi? That's the area that is orange. And that will give me then the probability of landing in the orange. Does that make sense? Now, I don't like doing it that way because I think this is more work than what's necessary. So when it says what's the probability of, ba basically what it, what it said when I land in the orange is the probability of not landing in a tree, right? That's what they're saying when they say probability of orange or probability of landing in the field. But if I say the probability of not not landing in a tree, okay, so if the probability of, um, so if I say probability of an event, that is equal to one minus the probability of not that event. We use that little tilde for the word not, okay? So that's the complement idea. So if not landing in a tree is what they're looking for, and I want to use the complement idea, the one minus the probability of not that event, I'm going to write this as one minus the probability. Now, if I say not not landing in a tree, what does that really mean? Land in a tree, right? Now, the reason I like to do it this way is because the, finding the area of the tree or the collective trees is easier than finding the area of the orange. If I want to find the area of the trees, that was 64 pi, and this one was 25 pi, right? Add those together, what do you get? 89 pi, right? So if I take 1 minus 89 pi, now 89 pi is landing, that's the area of the tree. I still have to divide that 89 pi by the entire rectangle, which would be 8,000. Okay, but that 89 pi over 8,000, that's the probability of landing a tree. One minus it, then would be the probability of not landing the tree, 
which is the goal of everybody that's parachuting, right? So you kind of see the two different dynamics, two different ways you can do that problem. I like to use the complement idea. There are, there are certain situations where you're going to come across and say, I can either use this here, this direct approach, or I can use the complement. Sometimes the only way that you can do a probability is to look at the complement. Okay, so that's why I do problems like that, uh, because eventually, and when we see more of them, when maybe we get to a, a probability statistics class, um, there are situations where the only approach you have is to use the complement concept. So try to make you aware of that, that concept uh, before you get to that point. Does that help with that question? Any others? Seven? Yeah? <laughs> Not very good? Alright, so a target with a diameter of 56 centimeters has a four scoring zones formed by concentric circles. It says the diameter of the center circle is eight, the width of each ring is eight. Um, a dart hits the target at a random point, find the probability that will hit the point in the blue. When I do problems like this, I'm always I'm always worried that when they say something like the width of each ring whether I'm interpreting that width correctly or not, okay? Um, I wish they would give you an, uh, a picture that says this is, if we're, if we're talking about the, the blue one, maybe they, they like, do something like that and say that is the width. That's what we're referring to. Does that make sense? Okay. Or maybe they do it in the red one and say that is the width. My fear is that some people will come across this problem and say, if I want to find, if they, when they say the width of each ring, so, so I'm saying, talking about the, uh, the blue one, maybe they think that that distance means the width of the blue ring. Does that make sense? Okay, so maybe they think diameter uh, is that. Because I, I think you can, there may be applications where you can interpret it differently. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly use this knowledge here that we have. The target has a diameter of 56, okay? Um, and let me, I'm going to cut this out because I think I can make it a little bit easier to see. All right, so it has a diameter of 56. So that means the radius would be how big? If diameter is 56. The radius has got to be 28, right? So that distance there has to be 28. So I'm going to see. That looks good on my computer. does not look good on the screen. Let's see here. They use such dark colors, and I don't really have anything that's going to look good on all three colors. Can you guys see that all right? All right, so that's they're saying that that distance is 28. Okay, says the diameter of the center circle is 8, so the white circle is going to have a radius of 4, right? And then I'm so all we're doing here is just checking to make sure that we have the right structure of radii here. They say that the diameter of the center circle is 8. The width of each other ring is 8. So the way I interpret that is that this is 8. That is 8. So we're talking about from there to there is 8. From there to there is 8, right? And then that last one, from there to there is also 8. Is that okay with everybody? What is 4 plus 8 plus 8 plus 8? 
28, which matches up to our diameter being 56, right? So I always, before I do the problem, because I, I have an overall plan already in my mind, but I'm just going to double check to make sure that I interpret their word usage for width correctly, okay? Now, if I want to land in the blue, okay, so we're going to go from, so probability of blue would be equal to blue area divided by total area, right? Okay. Now, the total area one, I, and I always like to do the sample space first, just because I think that's usually the easier one. Total area would be this circle, wouldn't it? Okay. Some people argue, well, Mr. Fed, what about the, the green circle? The green circle is just the background that, for whatever reason, Math Excel is using um, to, I don't know, capture the picture. Okay, uh, it, they don't give me any dimensions about that green stuff, do they? And because the circles are not tangent to the, uh, the sides of that square, there is absolutely no way that I can infer what that green area is. So that in itself tells me that that green area really should be, it'd be nice if Math Excel left it white so you didn't think that you had to divide by the, the squares area. Does that make, did anybody think that they had to do that? Everybody was on the same page that I had to hit the, at least inside the yellow circle somewhere, right? Okay. Um, and that's how I've kind of done this in the past was we would take and say, okay, well, you're going to hit the yellow circle. Okay. So we had to find the area of the yellow circle. Well, based on what we just talked about, the area of the yellow circle is pi r squared, so it would be 28 squared times pi. That would be the area of the circle, correct? Okay. Now, if we want to find the area that is blue, we can do this a couple different ways. Okay. Would you guys agree that this blue circle, so we could take the area of take the area of everything that is blue find that circle's area, right? Does that make sense? Which would be, what, 20, 20 squared pi. 400 pi would be the area of that blue, correct? And then what would I have to do to that? I would have to remove everything that is red now, correct? Does that make sense? And now give me the blue, okay? So the red would be 144 pi. It would be 12 squared times pi. Okay, so the blue area would be the blue, just trying to write uh, a plan here, it'd be the blue circle area minus the red circle, okay, which the blue circle we said would have been 20 squared times pi. And the red circle had a radius of 12, so we would say it would be 12 squared times pi, right? That's one way of doing it, okay? Now, if you were to see a multiple um, set of questions that ask you to repeat this over and over and over again, okay, um, which I'm actually going to do. We're going we're to kind of analyze this here in a moment. Where I'm going to ask you, well, what's the probability of hitting red? What's the probability of hitting white? What's the probability of hitting yellow? If we were to do this over and over and over again, I don't want to come up with, look, okay, now if I want to do the red, okay, well, that's the area of the red circle minus the area of the white circle, okay? Uh, if I wanted to do yellow, it would be the area of the yellow circle minus the area of the blue circle. I don't want to do that all the time, okay? So that blue ring, and we talked about this yesterday or the day before, a blue ring, the word ring uh, really isn't, a word for a geometric shape. It is actually called an annulus. Okay. Uh, and an annulus is kind of like a, you guys know what, when I say like nuts and bolts, a washer for nuts and bolts. Okay. Uh, every washer is an annulus. 
okay? Um, it is always found by taking pi times the larger radius, or the outlook, sometimes we call the outside radius, minus the smaller radius, which is the inside radius, okay? And that comes from, so basically if I multiply that pi through, I get pi r squared minus pi lowercase r squared. Well, that's the formula for area of a circle, right? So that right there is actually the area for that blue circle. That right there is the area of the red circle. Does that make sense? Okay. So if I want the blue one, the nice thing about finding the area of the blue ring this way, it's pi. So now I go find the outside radius. I go to the radius that would be the outside edge that defines the outside edge of the blue annulus. And that would be 4 plus 8 plus 8. So that's going to be um, 20. And then the inside radius is 4 plus 8. So that would be 12. Is that right there the same as that right there? Take a pi out of both these. You left with pi times 20 squared minus 12 squared. That kind of makes sense. So to find that blue area, I think that's the easiest thing to do. Okay, so probability of landing in blue is equal to blue area, which was pi 20 squared minus 12 squared over the total area, which would be 28 squared times pi. Is it okay? And what's going to happen is that that pi and that pi, they cancel, right? I'm left with 20 squared minus 12 squared all over 28. Okay? So what I'm going to ask you then, okay, we can find that probability. Let's find the probability of red. Probability of landing in red. Okay? Now, I know that the red annulus is much like the blue one, right? Same structure, same shape. So what's going to happen, if I go through all this work again, I don't want to go through all that work one more time, but if I did, I would recognize that the pies end up, end up canceling out just like they did here with the blue. Does it make sense? So this 20 was the outside radius of the blue. Now let it be the outside radius of the red. So that'd be 12. And this 12 here was the outside, or sorry, the inside radius of the blue. Let it now be the inside radius of the red, which is 4. And I'm still going to divide that by the total area of the target, which was 28 squared. And that would be the probability of landing in red. The probability of landing in white, it's a lot easier because it's not an annulus anymore. The white is a circle, right? So that's just going to be 16 pi. 16 pi over 28 squared. And then the probability of yellow would be now, we've got the outside radius would be 28. So we 28 squared minus the inside radius is going to be 20. And then we'll divide by 28 squared. So we'll calculate all these in a moment. Um, but I'm going to put them in order first. So the white, by what we know about dealing with um, hitting a bullseye, isn't the white going to be easier, or sorry, more difficult to hit? Okay. So I'm going to put the white one first. Uh, I'll put the red one next. Uh, then the blue one. And then we'll follow up with the, the yellow one. But when we do this in Desmos... And my hope is that we start to develop this idea that if we've got a, a preconceived idea about how a practical application works, how, what would really be happening if I were actually shooting an arrow or a dart at this target, where am I most likely to hit the target? Hopefully you see that it's the area that has a larger area or the, the spot that has a larger area. Um, so if I go to the white, so white is 16 pi over 28 squared. So we're looking at that. Okay. Uh, the red is 12 squared 
minus 4 squared. We'll divide that by... Twenty-eight squared. It doesn't know what to do with that R there. So that's the red area. Uh, the blue. This becomes twenty. Was 12. And if we go yellow, this was 28, and this was 20. So as we move out on our target, working from the inside out, 6%, 16%, 33%, 40%, 50%. Okay. Would you guys think, looking at that, that that yellow area is 50, almost 50% 50 of the target? Would you think that, looking at that picture? Probably not, right? Okay. Um, but what we're, what we're coming up with here is that, that it is indeed 50% of that image. Um, what should all of these add up to? Yeah, if I go, if I go W plus red, plus blue, plus yellow, okay? Um, now, there's a little bit of error here, uh, but we get pretty close to 100, okay? White, 16 pi. Is this okay? All right. Um, any others on there? So what question was that, seven? Lost my... I think I canceled out or closed out Math Excel. All right. Do we have any others you guys want to talk about? We can talk about any of them. 14? Okay, so is this any different of a question? Yeah, the way and, and so I I think we talked about this yesterday a little bit or the day before because they're like if you look at these like the blue is made up of two different rings, right? Okay. Um I think they're just trying to be fancy with their illustration. Um so when it says the yellow ring uh has a radius of 2 inches, I'm interpreting that it goes from there out to the edge of the yellow, all the way out to the the end of the yellow. Does that make sense? Um, so the width of each of the other rings is two, so I'm saying that, again then, that, and I can, I can see where that could pose a problem, but they're saying that that is two, that is two, and not four, correct? And the way I would check to make sure that that is um true is what do they say that they say that we have a diameter of 20 inches so if i go two inches there and then i let the other have two as well so the radius of the center ring is two inches so there's two and then this is two more this is two more two more two more so that's one two three four five iterations of two right so five times two gives me 10 inches for a radius correct so does that mean the diameter would have to be 20 inches? So then that would allow me to say that I know then that the widths are not maybe four, which is what I thought maybe because of the that extra white line between the regions. Is that okay? Do we need to go any further with that one or okay? Any others? Five?
Okay. So if I want to land in that sector, and this 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 will this will I think hopefully come full circle um, to what we talked about when we were trying to find a sector. Okay, and finding the area of sector. If you remember finding the area of the sector, it is what portion this thing is of the entire circle, right? Okay, so if I know that the area of a circle is pi r squared, then the area of the sector would be some ratio, which we found by taking x over 360, times the entire area of the circle, right? So if, if x was 60, this would be 1 sixth. And we say the this so let's say this is 60 right here. Then we'd be saying that this here is one sixth of the entire circle. So if I asked you, well, what's the probability of throwing a dart and landing in the blue? Well, you'd say it's one sixth because that's what proportion the blue is of the entire circle, right? And that's what that's what probability is. What portion of the entire sample space are your outcomes aligned with? Okay, um, so in order to do this, we're going to find the area of that sector, which X ends up being the, uh, the arc measurement, so 66 degrees over 360 times pi R squared, right? R here would be 3, so I'm going to make that times pi times 9, and that's fine. That would give me the area of the sector, correct? But if I want to find the probability of landing in the blue, I not only have to find the area of the sector, but I have to find the area of that circle, right? What's the area of that circle? 9 pi. So the probability of landing in the blue is the area of the sector divided by the area of the circle. What's going to happen with the 9 pi's? Don't they cancel each other out? And what are you left with? You're left with that ratio right there that was 66 over 360, which is telling me it's the proportion of the entire circle, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, you know, it, it's the idea that if, you know, um, if I give you like a spinner and I say that that spinner is broken up into three colors, What's the probability of it landing on blue if the colors are blue, red, and yellow? Well, isn't blue going to be one-third of that circle? Does that make sense? Okay, so um, be one out of three. So here we're saying that we're not one-third. We're 66 360ths of that circle. Okay, and that turns into... Um, if we put that as a decimal, 66 divided by 360.183. Okay, so 18.3%. One thing, being careful here, says round to three decimal places. Does it say anything about putting it as a percentage? No, okay. The only time that you'll put it in as a percentage is it'll have, it should have a fixed percent sign there. Okay, and I'll tell you. Otherwise, put it in at the decimal. Anything else? 13.6, number one. Okay, so a jar, I'm going to... Zoom out a little bit so I have some room to write here. Because I think you have to – so what I think with probability, and this is this is just going from experience when I was your age, um, and of all the math that I know, I struggle the most with probability. Okay? I think it's an abstract thing. I think it's hard to – it's like when you guys get into physics and you start talking about inertia and momentum and gravity. You can't see those things, right? You can't see gravity. You can see – the impact that gravity has on something, but you can't actually see the force of gravity, right? You can't see inertia. You can't see momentum, okay? 
so those are hard concepts. I think probability mathematically kind of aligns with that. Okay, it's kind of abstract. Um, so in order for me to understand probability the best, I, I have to draw pictures. I have to write down as much information as I can. I know people like to look at this type of stuff in Math Excel and just read it and go straight to the boxes and start typing things in. That's not setting yourself up for success. Okay. Um, so I like to write a lot of stuff down and try to um, organize my thoughts, organize my sample spaces, uh, and make things a little bit easier that way. So the jar contains eight large red marbles, four small red marbles, nine large blue marbles, seven small blue marbles. It says if a marble is chosen at random, which of the conditional probabilities is larger? Probability of blue given that it's small or probability of small given that it's blue, okay? So let's just look at um, how many blue marbles we have. Okay, we have um, nine large ones, and we have seven small ones, right? So we have 16 blue marbles. Let's talk about red marbles, and you'll see why maybe this information is important here to, to write it out as just blue and take away the small and large aspect of things. Um, so red marbles would be eight and four, correct? So total, that gives me 12. Okay. How many small marbles do you have? And I don't know if this will be even an important um, piece of information to write down right now. It could be later. I've got four small red, and I've got seven small blue, right? Okay, so that's going to give me 11. And then large, we have 8 large and 9 large. So it gives me, what, 17? Okay. Now, if I just, so, so we've got really two features, two variables here that we're describing these marbles with. Color and size, right? I've categorized them in colors. How many do I, how many, if I just look at blue and red, don't I have 28 total blue and red marbles? If I categorize them as size, do I still have 28 marbles? Yes. yes. Okay. The reason I try to decipher that information there is because I'm being asked to determine a comparison of blue given that it is small. And if you remember, our conditional probability of blue given that it's small is the probability of blue and small divided by the probability of, so you may remember what goes on the bottom here? It's the small one, okay? The denominator is always this last one in the given that um, event. Okay. I'm then asked the probability of small given that it's blue. Well, that's going to be the probability of small and blue divided by probability of blue, right? Okay. And now breaking things up this way, and I, it, I don't incorporate the red marbles at all here um, in regards to these rules that they, they do come into play here um, as my sample space, but by breaking things up like this, it's going to help me realize, okay, what was the probability of being small? Okay, well, how many marbles do I have total? I have 28 total marbles, right? How many of them are small now? 11. Okay. Probability of blue and small. How many were blue and small? Now, I don't have that written here, but it was described up here, right? Blue and small was seven, correct? Okay. So seven out of my 28 marbles 
were blue and small. That will reduce to 7 elevenths. Okay. Over here, probability of blue and small. Oh, we already did that. Scared the crap out of me. That's 7 out of 28, right? Blue and small, 7 out of 28. Probability of blue. Okay. Well, how many were blue? 16 out of 28, right? So now that's 7 out of 16. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, which of those numbers is a smaller number? Numerators are the same, right? Both are 7. So 7 16 because the 16 is bigger. We'll take that 7 and divide it into more little smaller parts. So 7 16 is a smaller amount than 7 11. And then I got, so I got to check, check the box that says, um, so this is smaller. So S given B, S given B is smaller. So B given S is larger. So I click that one. And then fill in the appropriate values to go with them. Does that kind of make sense? Um, we did, and you could say, I, I didn't set it up this way, but you could do like a contingency table that we talked about. Because there's two variables here. You can go, um, you can go large, small, um, red, and blue. How many were large and red? Large and red was, is that an eight? So large and red, you can put eight there. Um, small and red, put a four there. Uh, large and blue, so I'm looking at the intersections of these cell or these columns and rows. Large and blue would have been nine. And then um, small and blue was the seven. If I go across, there's the 17, there's the 11. Going straight down, you get 16, and you get your 12, and then adding these total rows up, or column, you get 28. And now the question would be, okay, well, which one is, and so now that we've got it set up that way, which I like these contingency tables because they, they allow for um, you to realize solutions a little bit quicker, it says the probability of blue given that it was small. So now I'm just going to look at this one here, okay? How many of them are blue in that group of small marbles? Seven out of 11, right? Okay. If I want to look at the next one that says probably small given they're blue, now I'm going to focus my attention on this column. Okay, because that I know they're blue, so I can refocus all my attention on here. And there's only 16 that are blue. How many of them are small given that they're blue? the same 7 out of 16, right? And it's giving me that result there. Anything else? 